I didn't realize this until recently. Apparently, for most of like the age of sail, we know how like ships and directions have all bunch of like funny different names. Yeah. I wasn't aware that port, meaning left, is actually yeah. quite a new term. Really? Yes. <gasps> It was larboard, wasn't it? It was. It was starboard and larboard. Larboard. And anyone instantly sees the problem with that situation. <laughs> yeah, that's right. On a ship where it's noisy. <laughs> Welcome to Because Language, a show about linguistics, the science of language. My name's Daniel Midgley, and with me now, it's my tireless podcast pal, Ben Ainsley. I... I'm... so... tireable. <laughs> no, I don't know where you've pulled tireless from. I'm tired a hundred percent of the time. My tired podcast pal, <laughs> Ben Ainsley. Weathered. Boy's got city miles on him. Well, hey, it's great to have you. Uh, Hedvig is on a work assignment, and she can't join up with us for this part of the show. But later on, Hedvig and I are talking to Dr. Rachel Nordlinger of the University of Melbourne. Delightful. So we will check in with time traveler Hedvig soon. We will. And there's a real story here based on the hottest of new research. You ready? I'm ready. I'm sending you a drawing. Uh, Sorry, I should have done that. I should have been ready for this. (laughs) Fantastic radio. Good thing it's live. Okay, I have sent you a cartoon, and Mm -hmm. our listeners can't see it, but that's okay, because I'm going to get you to describe this picture in a very simple sentence. Okay. A coloured clip art picture of a crocodile biting a man on the bottom. Okay, now I noticed that you started with the crocodile and not the man. Yes. Any insight as to why you might have started there? I think... Do I have genuine insight? No. Can I speak (laughs) in an uneducated manner? Absolutely. (laughs) Um, I think I would probably start with the most kind of like unusual thing and work my way towards more common. Okay. So if it had been a um, three-headed alien riding a crocodile, biting a man on the bum, I'd probably Mm. do it in that order. Yep. Right, rather than there is a man who is being bitten on the bum by a crocodile who in turn is being ridden by a three-headed alien. The man is kind of normal and the crocodile's kind of weird. Okay, well, that's true. And I think part of this is also that English is kind of the way it is. So we tend to go with the subject. We tend to put subjects first, although you don't have to. Mm -hmm. But the interesting thing is that's having an impact on what your eyes are doing in the first few milliseconds when you looked at that cartoon that I gave you. Oh, they've done eye trace studies on this, haven't they? (laughs) They've done eye trace studies. What if you didn't speak English? What if you spoke some other language that put the verbs first? Where does your eyes look then? So so you're like eyes blue languages instead of your blue eyes languages? Or what if you spoke a language that didn't have any fixed word order at all? What then? What are your eyes doing there? Hold on. Pump the brakes. (laughs) That sounds wild to me. It is. So Dr. Rachel Nordlinger has done that research. She studied the Australian language of Murumpata, and she's going to be telling us what she's found. Oh, that was all a juicy, juicy plug. That was a good plug. You've done it. You've done a good plug. Thank you. But here's another plug. Our latest bonus episode was our second trip into the linguistic time machine. We saw what language was like at a time depth of hundreds of thousands, even millions of years. You know what? I'm kind of enjoying the Daniel lecture series. I think we're going to we're gonna yeah. do more of those. I think we should keep. I think we should keep the good times rolling. I think we should do some sort of like fireside chat style thing. Gather round, children, as Grampy <laughs> Grampy Daniel is gonna gonna learn you some linguistic know how. Gonna hang out those slides somewhere. Well, if you'd like to hear all of our bonus episodes the minute they come out, become a patron at the listener level. No matter what level you join at, you get rewards like bonus episodes, mail outs, shout outs, live episodes, and our super duper Discord community. Hang out with the crew. So hop on and join up. That's patreon.com slash because lang pod. Well, now that you have finished plumbing your way through all of those plugs, I'm guessing there might have been a little bit of news in the world of linguistics in the week gone past. I think so. Let's talk about Sora, which just dropped last week. 
Have you been checking this out? Sora, not the main character from the Kingdom Hearts video game franchise, I'm assuming. You are correct. Is this the video AI thing? It is. Okay. You can take a text prompt and it'll make a movie. Turning text into movies is really something else. Is it? <laughs> I'm going to be that guy. Okay, but I'm thinking about the effect on artists and I'm thinking about uh, disinformation, especially during an election year. Um... You know, the tech stuff has been around now for, what, like 18 months? Yep. And the truly breathless declarations of it wholesale changing white collar work have just thoroughly failed to materialize. Well, okay. So I like that we're hosing down the hype a little bit because- Yes. Yes, yeah, you're right. Cooling it. That's all I want to do is I want to, just, I want to just cool it off. off. It's real cool. It's, 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 it's a really cool, cool thing. It's a fun toy. Hmm. Um, okay. like we certainly still need artists. We certainly still going to need videographers and producers mm -hmm. and directors. So, so hosing it down, it is really cool. It's really interesting. I kind of wanted to say the same thing. The, the ability to fake video, the ability to concoct video has been with us for a long time. Mm. This will make it easier for anyone to do very cheaply, very quickly, and very realistically. The people who wanted to use this nefariously. Mm-hmm. People making deep fakes of Obama saying things he never said or Trump saying things it. he never said or whatever, right? Yep. Um, they already had access to these tools and they weren't expensive or complicated. Mm. Um, so yep. I'm not entirely sure. I feel like all of the people who were going to use this sort of thing nefariously were already doing that. Yeah. So in one sense, nothing has really changed. We still need skepticism. I'm going to argue that we need skepticism more, More than yeah. we've ever needed More it. More than ever. Like a huge part of media literacy education now, I think, needs to be, don't buy it. Where did <laughs> that come from? Where did that come from? How yeah, do you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't just, don't just consume. And I'm just as susceptible to this as anyone else. And I've definitely found myself doing a whoopsie and sharing a thing and then finding out that there was like shitty provenance on it and yep. feeling like an absolute tool. It can happen to, well, <laughs> I was about to say really smart people. I'm not one of those. <laughs> it can happen to like- <laughs> Yes, you are. Dummy dum dums, and it can happen to smarty smart smarts and everyone in between. And these tools, yes, okay, it is making it even, even, even cheaper. But people were out there fucking with this shit for a while now anyway. Yeah. All the same problems that we've been wrestling with are still there. Uh, and, the, I, and the real problems are not destruction of society. The problems are- Continuing to fuck with society in ways that we have been fucking with society for a long yeah, time. Yeah, th this is not um, the end is nigh. This is like the downward spiral we've been on for a really long time mm. is just taking another notch downward. And we need to reinforce our civil uh, engagements and our democratic systems. And we need to make sure that like courts aren't being fucking stacked with like insane idiots and all the rest of it, right? Yep. This doesn't change that very much, I don't think. No, okay. But it is a good reminder that mm. this shit is happening and we need to be a vanguard for, like, shitty, bad misinformation bullshit. There's another thing in that people talk about jobs. Oh, no, jobs are going to be lost. And I've been thinking, yeah, this is going to affect the job market a lot. But as with other technological change, I feel like it's going to move jobs around. It's yeah. going to hit people hard in certain sectors, but it will move jobs around. Paul Krugman did an interesting mail out this week in the New York Times about uh, something called the lump of labor. People say, oh, no, this is going to remove jobs. No, this time it's really going to remove jobs. And his answer is, it's not like there's a, a lump of labor that needs to be performed. And if machines take part of the lump, it means there's less for humans to do. It also opens up the job market in some ways. I mean, we're, we're essentially talking about creative destruction, right? As like an economic concept. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm sure that there will be significant job losses, like right now in tech, right? You're mm -hmm. seeing thousands of jobs slashed through the tech sector in America, but that's not new. Yeah. You know, like, like factories were shutting down in the 70s and 80s and um, sort of like- all uh, manufacturing was offshored out of America a long, long time and out of Australia a long, long time ago. And, and it all of those, for people, those people, who, yeah, it yeah. was really, really bad and tough and hard. And so when those, those, I'm not trying to be flippant about the fact that this stuff doesn't matter. It, de it definitely mm. matters, and we need really good mechanisms in place to help 
transition people from sort of like obsoleted jobs and, and professions into other stuff. Um, but yeah, I think there's this idea that no, this thing is going to be the thing that makes us all need universal basic income or something mm. because like <laughs> yeah. 50% of the world is going to be unemployed in some sort of like dystopian cyberpunk hellscape. Um, and look, it's really easy to be a, a cynic about this stuff and go, no, it's not, no, it's not, no, it's not, because it's the safe bet. And eventually we're probably going to be wrong. There will be something that comes along eventually, probably. Um, but I, I really don't think cute videos being made by prompts is the final proper no. flying horseman of us all losing our jobs. And Krugman's big point that convinced me was he showed what happened when women entered the workforce. Did men drop out of the workforce at the same rate? <laughs> no. No, they really didn't. It changed a lot. It changed a lot. Oh, definitely. I will just say, though, the one thing that still makes me hesitate, a robot with artificial general intelligence that can learn to do anything a human could do, that might be the thing. Are we, like, how far away are we from a learning machine like that, though? That's... I don't know. A, a safe one, one mm. that won't like injure people if it encounters errors or anything like know. that. That's, I don't know. that's a, I don't know. Yeah. Um, but I feel like we're off of language now and I think we should probably move on. <laughs> true. <laughs> okay. True, true, true. This story was suggested to us by Wolf of the Wisp and by Kara on Discord. Ben, you'll remember the work of Dr. Caleb Everett in Geophonetics. We covered it just a little while ago. People who live in mountainous areas do certain things with the way their language works so they don't expel air and, and stuff like that. Yeah, it's enjoying a resurgence now. Okay. It feels like we've cycled in and out of this stuff many times. Yeah, Wolf says if they hadn't done it before, they'd only do it again. Well, there's been some new work and some movement in the area, so I wanted to cover it just because it's something that we know very well and that we've covered a lot. So this is some work by Tian Hang Wang of the School of Liberal Arts, Nankai University in China, and a team published in PNAS Nexus. They're trying to further the work by Dr. Everett on geophonetics, the idea that climate has an effect on language. So let's just once again do a very quick run through of the three Everett experiments. Number one, the correlation between high altitude and ejectives like k, not, uh, not k, but k. Number two, Correlation between low humidity and lack of tone. Okay. And three, correlation between cold temperature and less sonority. And the way that usually shakes out is that if you have a language in a hot climate, you get lots of consonant vowel, consonant vowel. There's a higher proportion of vowels to consonants in the language. And if you are in a cold place, you tend to get these crunchy consonant clusters like kr and ch and str and things okay. like that. And it was celebrated, and then it was sort of disproven, and then it was re like like the like Lazarus it emerged, and then some other people like no, and it's it's kind of cycled through this yes no yes no yes no thing for a while. It kind of has. We've had chats with Doctor Everett. In the end, we weren't convinced because of these reasons. The significance was good, but the effect size was tiny. So how do you know that's really what's doing it? The results were not robust, like when our friend Sean Roberts reran the second experiment with humidity and tone using a different database of tone. The results failed to replicate, fell apart. And here was the most important for today. We weren't convinced because the third experiment, higher temperature correlated with more vowels, they used word lists to figure out the proportion of vowels to consonants in the language. They didn't use a long string of spoken text like the one I'm doing now. Right. They looked at word they, lists. They analyzed so, a dictionary. And that could give you different results. Right. And that idea, I think, would be locked to the, the idea of uh, a dictionary is just a list, whereas a language has grammar. And so certain words will only ever sort of link up in certain ways. So you will not get a particularly accurate read of like consonant vowel if you just look at the list. You need to see how it plays out grammatically. Yeah, some words are more common, some words are less common, especially okay. the long ones. Okay, mm. now let's get to this new work. This one is about the third experiment with heat and vowels. I say vowels. I should say sonority, um, which vowels are sonorous, but other sounds are too. I wanted to see if they addressed that particular criticism of Everett's work. Did they use a corpus of spoken language or did they just use word lists? And it appears that by reading the article, they say, in this study, we utilized vocabulary lists of basic words. 
No, oh, boo. All right. And that's just even basic words, so it really didn't address this criticism. And then we see all the coverage in the non-linguistic media, which I linked to in the <gasps> run sheet, which many people will remember. Here are some headlines. This is from fizz.org. Linguistic study claims that languages are louder in the tropics. <laughs> That's not even the thing, though. <laughs> it's, it's, not... It makes it sound like everybody's like, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> is it just me or does that have a bit of a whiff of a kind of colonial yeah, vibe as well, right? Like, like oh, those 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 wacky, hot-blooded, those temperate happy people. Those <laughs> lucky people. That's not what the paper is. No, but it's like, it's, it seems like that's what the, the vibe behind that story was, is like, it does. oh, this will get, this will feed into some sort of like mild existing bias that exists in Westerners. And this is the same as the headline from Atlas Obscura. People may speak more loudly or quietly depending on the climate, which is not really what it's saying. It's, I mean, if you have vowels like ah or e, those are more sonorous and they will be louder than things like s or t, right? I mean, that is a thing, but that's, that's not what this research is saying. When you publish stuff as a researcher, you these days, if I'm not mistaken, you also have to play the game. So you make a press release. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. So you've published your thing, but you don't just trust that your little journal or whatever it is is going to like land on the desks of science reporters all around the world, right? So you make a press release. And are we thinking that this person in their press release put louder <laughs> in there because- it seems pretty striking that several different places are all plucking that particular string. The difficulty here is describing the concept of sonority. So sounds oh, okay. in languages have a certain uh, hierarchy of sonority. Up at the top, the most sonorous are vowels like ah and ooh. They carry the sound. And then, you know, a little bit lower down, you've got the sounds like ul and er and the nasals like m mm and n. Mm. Down at mm. the bottom, you've got all the quiet things like sh and s and t and d. Right. Those are, those are relatively less sonorous. So you're trying to explain what sonority is. And, and I imagine that the word loud is going to come out somewhere right. and people understand. And then, and, then, and then people are like, oh, so the language is louder. And it's like, no, well, that's not. No, no. That's not but, oh, <laughs> loud languages. How about that? Depends on climate. <sighs> Through all of this, our friend Sean Roberts has been on the case. I mentioned that he retried the second experiment, humidity and tone, with a different tone database, and the results fell apart. Right. He's got a new paper along with the team. This one's about the second experiment with humidity and tone. It's called Investigating Environmental Effects on Phonology Using Diachronic Models. This is published in Cambridge Core, which could also be an aesthetic. <laughs> Cambridge Core, yeah, totally. Cambridge Core. Like Norm Core's posh English brother. Yeah. Hey, Cambridge pals, Kitty, Romani, what's Cambridge Core? What would that be? Please let <laughs> us know. Anyway, they studied the Bantu language family because it's got a lot of variation in both humidity and tone. It's got everything from rainforest to savanna and everything in between. And they do some complicated analysis, which you can read. We've got the article on our show notes page. And they say... We find no evidence to support the previous claims that humidity affects the emergence of lexical tone. So um, they have kind of put the second experiment to bed. I'm sure they're working on the others, but I really respect Sean for doing the work, going back and trying to replicate results that other people have found, sometimes working with them to make their research better. He's doing a great job. So can I ask a potentially quite impolitic question? Why not? Um, is Sean Roberts beefing with Caleb Everett? <laughs> like, is a, it seems like, like, sure, and I don't mean this as a as a burn at all, but it seems like Sean's coming along and be like, your data, I don't know. And then, <laughs> and then just, like, constantly being like, wrong, still wrong. I don't think so. We had Sean on the show to talk about this when he tried to replicate the second experiment. I said, is that it? Is it done? He said, it doesn't mean it's done. It just means that this stuff is hard and tone is tricky. We're talking about tricky things. So okay. so Sean isn't beefing with Caleb. Is Caleb like, <laughs> go to work, stop it, <laughs> leave my shit alone? Not to my knowledge. Dr. Everett has been pretty quiet on this front and it sounds like he's working on different things to okay. my knowledge. Okay. I just, I just... It seems like academia, obviously it's all hoity-toity and well-to-do from an outsider's perspective, but you can imagine that 
internally there would actually be significant acrimony between people who are like tearing down other people's research and all that kind of stuff. There is. However, if you're doing it right, then... Oh, because people always do all the things right, Daniel. No, they, they <laughs> don't. And, th and we're talking about an idealized model of science that we like to adhere to, but don't. And yet, because we like to adhere to it, we would probably have to admit that ideas are forged in the hot iron of conflict. This is <laughs> that was so poetic. I loved it. Thank you. I do have my flights of fancy at times. <laughs> um, you know, we don't we don't like to be told we're wrong, but we would have to admit that we want we want it to be true. That it matters not who is right, but what is right. Okay. And if you aren't willing to do that, then you're on the the bad path. We'll move on from the beef, the not beef, the, the not beef, the, the not beef the beyond. We'll go beyond the beef. Oh, God. Let's talk about one more. This one was suggested by Diego on our Discord. What do you know about the history of Rapa Nui, the island off the coast of Chile? Uh, commonly referred to in pop culture as Easter Island. Mm -hmm. um, it formed... I actually have uh, a, few little, a few little possible facts, possible factoids kicking about in my head. Okay. Um, so let's run down the list. Um, it is most famously known globally for having the, I think they're called the Moai. The Moai, right? those heads. The Moai, yeah. the, the huge, well, they look like heads, but they're often actually heads and, and bodies, statues. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And for a long, long time to, again, a Westerner's perspective, um, these Moai were seen as like a bit of a kind of stonehenge like how could they do it? Especially considering Rapa Nui is more or less devoid of like trees, um, it is now. Yes. So uh, the, the the white people who arrived at Rapa Nui found it very puzzling that the native inhabitants could have made these huge, and they are, they're huge um, sort of carvings out of volcanic um, igneous rock in a, in a landscape that really didn't seem like it was producing much in the way of stuff to make tools and structures and all that kind of thing. I also know that... For a long, long time, Rapa Nui was kind of considered, I guess you could say, an anthropological cautionary tale of um, a group of human beings, I who I think are called the Rapa Nui, um, who basically like deforested and, and ecologically sort of painted themselves into a corner. Um, mm. But I'm also, a little, little thingies uh, ticking away in my head, that um, some of that analysis, that anthropological analysis of the people of, or the, sorry, the archaeological analysis, because there's this idea that the people now are not Rapa Nui and like all the Rapa Nui died out. And that's just categorically false. The people who still exist on Rapa Nui are like a direct line of descendants from the Rapa Nui. Yep. Um, and the idea that they just like obliterated their own island is actually not particularly accurate. And they were living just fine and doing okay. And then white people came and were like, hmm, I assess the following things about you. Yeah, there's a lot of that, the, especially because a lot of the Rapa Nui were taken and enslaved. Mm -hmm. And then Europeans made contact in the like 1720s, that's going to be important, took away and enslaved some of the Rapa Nui people. And then when those people came back, they accidentally brought diseases, which killed a lot of the leaders and the people who could read... Rongo Rongo. Which I'm going to guess is the language of the Rapa Nui. It's a kind of script. It's not okay. the same as the language. We don't know exactly what language they spoke, although we know that they were Southeast Polynesians who arrived yep. at Rapa Nui anywhere between 300 to 1200 CE. So there were... Ugh, we're touching on so many different cool things here. So they were yeah. part of the waves of Polynesian expansion, but we don't know which wave they were a part of necessarily. Is that right? That's correct. And it seems, I read this from Wikipedia, when James Cook visited the island, when was that? In the 1770s, one of his crew members, a Polynesian from Bora Bora Hiti Hiti, was able to communicate with the Rapa Nui. Okay. That's interesting. So, mutually intelligible Polynesian language. I think they probably made do. Yep. So let's talk about the writing. Rongo Rongo looks a lot like writing. It's characters in a line. There are images. It's not letters like we have them, but sort of pictures. There are animals and plants and tools and body Wouldn't parts. Wouldn't we call them sort of pictographs, like a like a um, Egyptian? 
Definitely. Um, okay. Not hieroglyphs exactly, but yes, pictographs is a, a good way of describing it. And they're arranged in a line and they seem to like start at the bottom and go this way. Then at the end of the line, they turn around and go the other way. Then they turn around and go okay, the other so way. Like so like marching ants sort of snaking their way up. We would call it boustrophedon in writing lore. Okay, so there are 27 wooden objects that we have. They were wood. And it has this Rongo Rongo script on it. Nobody's deciphered it yet. No. The provenance of these items, were they sort of taken by white people and then like went all over the world and we've slowly been collecting them back in the way of these sorts of things? That is correct. None of them are still on Rapa Nui. None of these 27 objects. And no one has deciphered it because a lot of the people who used to, to understand the script were killed. So here's the question. Mm -hmm. In our last episode on the linguistic time machine, we mentioned that there were three different times when writing has arisen. China, Mesopotamia, and Mesoamerica, like the okay. Incan Empire and things. So there's yep. three. Could it be that the people of Rapa Nui came up with the idea of writing independently as maybe a fourth example of writing emerging? Interesting. Or was it simply imported after European contact? Okay. So they were like, oh, so these European people are doing some funky stuff with taking their language and then like making it into things. Maybe yeah, we'll try that. Let's try that. So this is work by Dr. Silvia Ferreira from the University of Bologna in Italy and a team published in Nature's Scientific Reports. They say, this is in the abstract, central to this issue is whether the script was invented before European travelers reached the island in the 18th century AD, because they would have brought writing. Yep. Well, these examples of Rongo Rongo are on wood, so... Okay. so we can date them? We can carbon date them. We can carbon date them, but wood can be really, really old, right? Can we carbon date them and tell when the markings in the wood were made? Is that possible? That is the tricky bit. The authors okay. acknowledge that the engraving might have been done long after the wood was gathered. But at this stage, they're trying to date the wood, and that's so that they can determine a kind of, like, beginning point. If that's after 1700s, then forget it. But if it's older, then maybe. They've already dated two tablets, and they were in the 19th century AD, 1800s. Okay. Right. So this new work involved looking at four wooden objects. They calculated when the trees were felled by looking at the rings. And they looked at three of them, that's A, B, and C, and they dated them between 1785 and 1848, so after European contact. Mm -hmm. But the fourth one looks to be solidly in the mid 1400s, like two or 300 years before the Europeans arrived. Right. It's old wood. It's not from the island. Actually, it's from South Africa. And it could have been driftwood, possibly from a shipwreck, because it's made of the kind of wood that people made ships out of. Oh, okay. And they reckon this is pre-European contact. But of course, the tricky bit is we don't know when they carved on it. it the right. wood was... The wood was they old. Have, they could have had like a really cool old piece of wood that had been hanging out for a couple hundred years on Rapa Nui. And then they were like, I'm going to carve some stuff into this. Or they could have taken whatever was carved on it or whatever it was doing, scratched it out, and then repurposed it. Because that's what they did with wood that was so valuable. Right. So at least we know that the wood itself and possibly the carvings themselves predate European contact. And therefore, this might be an example of a fourth writing system. I wonder if there's any way to verify that, right? The carving being early, not just the wood being early. Oh, yeah, so cute. Like, that's so fascinating. Uh, thanks to Diego and all our Discordians who have been talking about this. You can find all the links that we're talking about in the show notes for this episode. That's becauselanguage.com. It's time for our favorite game, Related or Not. Related or not, is it connected to the word and the other word? <laughs> Do you know what we need? We need a theme tune for this segment, and not that one. We need, we need, we need to reach out to um, Drew Kraplianov. Help! Otherwise, Could Ben's going to keep singing his shit. You know what? If you're a musician and you want to donate a song to us for Related or Not, just send us, send us what you got. We'll play it. I will take, I will take sad uh, queer boy ukulele folk. I will even take that. That would be better than Ben Ainsley. Hey, hey, there's nothing wrong with that. That's a, that would actually be a preferred genre. I just want to be clear. The thing in that sentence that I take issue with is 100% the ukulele. 
<laughs> just <laughs> okay okay just checking yeah, yeah all you bedroom artists take note yeah okay the first one comes from lenika hey lenika she says related or not waffle the food and waffle and waffle the, the 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 thing ben does <laughs> There's two meanings of waffle, I think, but I'm going to lump them under the same thing. There's to talk a lot, which is what Ben does. And yeah. then there's to prevaricate, to be indecisive. He waffled on the matter, which means he flip-flopped. I've kind of never thing. heard it used that way. That must be an American thing. I feel like waffle, like to talk and talk and talk, seems more prevalent these days. He's waffling on, right? Yeah, exactly. That's the only use I've heard of. Okay. Is it related to the food? Is it related or not? Ooh. Shall I start? Um, yeah, go for it. I thought yes, kind of, because I thought of waffle as being imitative. Waffle, 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 waffle. Oh, okay. So the, you reckon the food was named after the thing Ben does? Okay. I thought that the food might have come later. I also thought that maybe because waffles get floppy, so some sort of flip. Yeah, when you when you make waffles, like I make waffles on some Sundays. And at first they're really crisp, but then after about an hour, they absorb all the moisture in the room and then they're really gross and floppy. And I thought maybe that's the flip floppy sense. So I thought that they were probably related, but I also thought of an imitative origin for waffle. Maybe the, maybe the, the food helped it along. It's an interesting one. Uh, waffle is in that really nebulous zone of like length and complexity, right? If it was any longer... <laughs> Uh, or more complex, I would be like definitively related, right? Like yeah. there's no yeah. way that this is an accidental thing. And if yep. it was any shorter, I'd be like, nah, like it, it's so easy to just be like, blah, blah. Too easy to converge. It's in that sweet spot, isn't it? Yeah. So it's it's not easy to differentiate that way. I'm going to go, I'm going to go with related as well. And mm -hmm. I think it was the other way around. I think, How so? I think food name came first. Right, because okay. Belgian waffles have been around for a while, at least probably like two hundred years, I reckon. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I think maybe it's related to like the tradition in France of like people, like all the all the fucking philosophers and stuff, sitting in cafes and talking. <laughs> like maybe maybe there's some connection to that, and so people would like waffle and talk and talk and talk at like places yep. where you got waffles. Okay, the answer is they're not related. Oh! Oh, damn it. Although I was a little bit closer, it is imitative like I thought, but it comes okay. from a different word, to woff, which means to yelp like a puppy. Woof, woof, woof. Oh, okay. Okay. That's cute. But what do you know? The all is frequentative, which means you do it a lot. Oh, so woof, 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 Yeah. Remember how we said that spark and sparkle, if you got one thing, it's a oh, spark, but a okay. bunch of them, it's a sparkle. And crack and crackle. Old English used to have a productive frequentative all, and this is what that is. Now, here's the surprise. Waffle, the tasty breakfast food, instead comes from, it comes later Damn. to waffle, from. but it is actually earlier. So it comes from about the 1700, 1794 to be precise, the phrase waffle iron comes up. And it comes from an old English word, wefan, to weave. Oh, that makes sense because it does look, it's got like that crosshatch pattern. It's got a weavy pattern. That's why yep. it's also related to the word wafer. So. Oh, because they've got, yeah, okay. Zero and zero for us. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Lanika. Let's go on to our next one. This one's from Angry Balls. Ah, classic. The English word she mm -hmm. and the Irish word she, which are both a pronoun for her. Oh. Oh, this seems like a trick. Like, like <laughs> everyone would be like, yeah, of course they're related. Because, like, obviously Ireland's right next to England, blah, 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 blah. Pronouns never change. Yeah, and, and then it's going to be like, sucked in. Irish is like freaking ancient idiot. We had she for like a billion years and you took it from us. Or something like that. Yeah. Um, oh, but now I'm second guessing myself. But then, could it be that there's the old double reversi uno whammy? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> this is what I think. Mm -hmm. like, like, add two, add four. He'd do it. I'm going to go not. I'm going to go not. I'm going to trust my gut. I feel like okay. this is a trick. I feel like the obvious answer is yes. So I'm going to go with no, that they are completely accidental, like like octopus eyes in my eyes. I happen to know this one. Okay. Uh, and you are correct. They are not related. <laughs> I don't know where Irish she comes from, but I do know, because I do electron pronouns, that she in English is actually quite new. I say. Yeah. It was once heo or heo. That was what you would use for a woman. But because of sound change, by the 1200s, it sounded way too much like the word for he. 
Yeah, totally. Well, that's what I was just thinking. I was like, well, that's dumb. Heo, heo. Yeah, that sounds like he. So they yeah. had to, it's like they had to move. So sometime around the 1200s, English speakers changed it from he to she because they borrowed the word seo or seo, which meant that one. Okay. That one. Cool. Which means that she is a neo pronoun. And funnily enough, about 50 years ago or 80 years ago, you could still find people in like the north of England who wouldn't say, is she married? They would say, is she married or is who married or is her married? And that all meant, is she married? Wow. Isn't that wild? Mm -hmm. Now, that was the path for English. We, we had a pronoun that sounded a lot like he, but then we changed it to that one, which sounded like she. The path for Irish she is different. I'm reading from Wiktionary. It's from Old Irish she, from Proto-Celtic she, sounds the same, from Proto-Indo-European C, that's spelled S-I and then the second of the H's. There are three H's, and we don't know what they sounded like in Proto-Indo-European, but check this out. This is the part you're not going to believe. It's two things. It's so and e. Those are the two parts of she in Proto-Indo-European. Okay. So means that one. Oh, Just like so English. It's, okay. So it's, it is octopus eyes. It's like they took the same path unrelated to each other. Yep, it's convergent evolution. It's just that one with a feminine ending. So it is, it's octopus eyes. Wow, that's, that is really interesting. <laughs> so it means that girl. Hey, Marlo Thomas reference. So the answer is they're not related, but they followed the same track. Thanks, Angry Balls. Just tracing their own little journey side by side. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's finish with one from Jen via email. Hello at becauselanguage.com. Jen writes us saying, I discovered your podcast recently and have been binging it because it's unbelievably amazing. Don't you feel amazing, Ben? <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> so I grovelingly apologize if you have covered this already. The other day, my boyfriend tried to say scalpel, but stumbled and said something more akin to scapula. Oh, yeah. I said they must be related, because I'm pretty sure scapula have historically been used as blades or knives. In fact, we even talk about shoulder blades, don't we? We do. We tried looking it up, but it didn't feel conclusive. I love language and have a degree in anthropology, and my boyfriend is an English teacher with a degree in bioarchaeology. Wow. So, Good God. It sounds like they could answer this question better than us. If you please. So if you could solve the mystery, it would make us extremely happy. Thank you so much for making a show that I can and do listen to all day long. All the best, Jen. Good God. Okay. Um... So we're talking scalpel and scapula, related or not? So first things first, I'm going to go ahead and say that scapulae, mm -hmm. whatever plural we want to use, okay. have probably not been used for blades in prehistory. Okay. Uh, I think they would probably far more readily be used for plates and bowls and other things that work really good when you have like a flat semi kind of curved surface. Mm -hmm. um, now, that doesn't mean that the words aren't related necessarily. Because, yeah, we do call them shoulder blades for a reason, right? Like, because we have these other things called blades, which are, like, thin and have, like, a leading edge and all the rest of it. My doctor partner says scapulas are pretty sharp. I'm thinking they are related, and I'm thinking they're related because of, like, snooty medical lingo reasons. Taking it back to Latin, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking that in the era when we were, like, uh... Maybe science and medicine instead of like woo woo nonsense, and then they started mm -hmm. just naming everything with Latin shit. Um, yep. I'm gonna go with related for that reason. Okay, what I wrote was, "What the heck?" I'm going. Yes, they sound the same. They have a plausible connection. I bet scapula is straight Latin, and I wasn't sure about scalpel. Okay. Okay. The answer. I'm not sure. Let me just read what I got. <laughs> Oh, you're about to give such an unsatisfying answer to these two people. I am, but but for a good reason. Okay. Scapula dates from 1578, according to the OED, the Oxford English Dictionary. It is straight Latin from Proto-Indo-European scap, which is like skep, to cut or to scrape. Okay. So, like, we called it that because, at the very least, it looks like a cutty thing, if not is used for a cutty thing. If you needed to scrape some wood or something, you would use oh, a scapula yeah, true. Yeah, to scrape, do that. Scrape, yeah. Okay, scrape, scrape, scrape. So that's the thing that we use to scrape. So we call it a we'll call it skep, and it became scapula. Scalpel, also Latin, scapellum, diminutive of scalprum, related to scolpere to carve, 
But this goes to a different Proto-Indo-European root, not skep, like we have a scapula, but skel, to cut. But they're related sounds, right? We're thinking that in Proto-Indo-European, like this family of things probably had similar sounds. Skel, skep, squee, I don't know. But that's not even all. There was skel, there was skep, there was skur, there was skay, and they all meant to cut or to scrape. Oh, okay, sorry. So and I I'm, think I'm feeling uh, like we're one step away from the root of all of those things, right? I'm not a reconstructionist. I don't know from Proto-Indo-European. Were they allomorphic? Were they the same word, just in different forms for different reasons? I don't know. But, 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 I'm, but, but, but we should probably acknowledge, like, okay, if we go far, 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 far enough back, they are related. But we're now going into the, like, the misty fog of war distant, I know, distant past. I know. So, like, you could probably say no, I think. I should say no, right? That would be the textbook answer because you look at skull, you say, well, no, one is skull and one is skep. They both mean yep. the same thing, but they're different forms. And then I remember that these words are hypotheticals based on the best evidence we have. They've been hanging around, mixing it up for centuries. I should say no, but I feel like giving this a qualified <laughs> maybe. You got, you got a vibe. You got a gut check got on a, this one. I, I got, my vibe check tells me that this, <laughs> this is still possible. There's more going on behind the scenes, and categorical answers probably aren't going to help us out that much. So etymologies aren't always definite or certain. So thanks, Jen, for that one, because I'm glad that it raised this point. If anybody wants to chime in, let us know. Hey, thanks to everybody who are sending these games to us. We're having fun with them. If you have one, send it. Or if you've already sent us one and it's been a while, then send it again. And if you want to do a theme tune for this segment, then send that too. They can all go to hello at becauselanguage.com. We're talking to Professor Rachel Nordlinger, Director of the Research Unit for Indigenous Language and the Linguistics Discipline Chair at the University of Melbourne. Hey, Rachel, thanks for having a chat with me and Hedvig today. Hi, nice to talk to you both. We've been talking over the last year or so about how we do language and what's going on in our minds when we do it. We've become aware of how you're approaching this question when it comes to looking at a scene and deciding how to put things in words. And not just in English. So we wanted to ask you about it. How does that sound? Sure. Let's do it. Love to talk about it. <laughs> well, let's just find out about you. So you are at the University of uh, Melbourne uh, mm -hmm. doing linguistics. How did you get here? Well, so I started an arts degree as an undergrad a long time ago. We don't need to go into how long ago that was. <laughs> and I just came to university loving languages. I I just had enjoyed doing languages at school. I didn't really know what I was going to do with languages, but that's what I was going to do at uni. So I did um, French and Italian and then discovered this subject called linguistics. And that I realized once I started doing linguistics that actually what I loved about languages was actually linguistics. Um, and I was never going to have time to learn every language in the world. But if I did linguistics, I could really get to the nuts and bolts of things really much <laughs> faster. So from then on, I only did linguistics. And one of the subjects I did was a subject on uh, Australian Aboriginal languages with Nick Evans, who's now at ANU, but he was at Melbourne at the time. And that was just super fascinating because they're just really interesting languages and do things so differently from English that my little nerdy language brain loved that. And then I had an opportunity to do field work with the Bilinata people in uh, Victoria River Downs region of the Northern Territory, uh, which I took. Uh, I took the opportunity. That was for my honours thesis. And then really, I just sort of haven't looked back. I just loved that so much. I loved the combination of the really interesting linguistic data and questions and interesting languages with the field work side where you where you get to really engage with the people and under, and learn about the culture and build relationships. And the, the combination for me was just fabulous. So I've sort of been doing that really ever since for about, well, 30 years now. I was clearly five when I started. <laughs> <laughs> so my interest has always been about the languages, the people who speak the languages, 
um, and, you know, how we can learn more about what it is to be human and the way humans are through looking at their languages in interesting ways. I wanted to ask about Australian languages since you're well versed in what's going on there. Um, mm -hmm. It seems to me that it, it used to be that linguists, white people usually would go in and study a language and take away what we could find out. Now there's much more of an emphasis on getting Aboriginal linguists to do the work, uh, working with community, giving back to the community. Is this what you're finding? What, what's the scene like now? How's it changed? Oh, I think it's definitely changed in that way over the last, you know, 50 years or so. Um, unfortunately, I don't think linguistics has been great at getting a lot of Aboriginal people into the sort of academic side of linguistics, but there are lots and lots of Aboriginal people who are very, very engaged with language work and, you know, very passionate about it in their own communities. And I think linguists are much more aware these days than perhaps they were in the past of the importance of doing this sort of work in collaboration with people in communities, ensuring that Aboriginal communities and Aboriginal people are really involved in all aspects of the work in, in sort of um, driving some of the research questions, all those sorts of uh, collaborative aspects of the work. So I think it's really changed in that way. And there's a lot of a lot of emphasis and a lot of uh, energy going into um, trying to uh, encourage Aboriginal people to do more and more of this uh, linguistic work and we're, and, and to, to really think about ways in which we can enable that in, in ways that, that people want to do it, right? So it can't just be our academic way of doing things. We need to really think about, well, what is it that people really want to do and how can we support and enable people to do it in their way? Does that mean that... Um like the way that we describe languages themselves has changed because people want different things described or anything like that? Well, yeah, it's an interesting question because I think we, so there, there is often a bit of debate about the fact that linguistic outputs, linguistic academic outputs are often full of all sorts of terminology that if you're not trained as a mm -hmm. linguist, it's a little hard to really follow what's going on. So yeah, um, sure. the question then is what, how should you produce things in a way that make it uh, accessible for non-linguist community members? And I think it probably, I mean, I don't want to speak for everyone, but I think that what many of us now do is do both. So we, we can see a value in the linguistic outputs because I guess it's like an analogy might be like with medical science you want to you still want to describe things in the really precise way that that um, gets the, the sort of description as detailed and accurate as possible for medical scientists but then you also want to have a version that is accessible to people who aren't trained in that way. So a lot of us mm -hmm. do things like we might write a grammatical description that's that's really more um, for the sort of linguistic analysis side, but then think about helping the community put together uh, a dictionary and um, learners' guides and other more community-oriented resources that will sort of suit their needs as well. Yeah, we talked earlier, and uh, Daniel's going to remember what episode to Leslie Woods at ANU, who's doing mm -hmm. a plain language uh, grammar and talking about not only making like more material that is accessible to community, but also writing the descriptions themselves in a more accessible way. Um, yeah, yeah. It's really important, but it's also why we need more and more Aboriginal people like Leslie. Mm -hmm being engaged in this because I've had the experience myself of um, doing what I thought was a publicly accessible, you know, sort of plain language learner's guide of Wombaya, which is a language that I worked on um, many years ago, or one of the first languages I worked on. And mm -hmm. I wrote the grammar and then I did the learner's guide and I made it as plain language. I thought it was, you know, really plain language for people who didn't know linguistics to understand. And yet... Yeah. I had feedback from community saying, actually, we don't understand what you're talking about oh, and it's not no. the plain language you thought it was. Oh, no. <laughs> so I think sometimes sometimes it can be hard for 
those of us who end up getting so specialised in linguistics to actually mm-hmm. sort of almost forget what yeah what non linguists need, <laughs> I suppose. Yeah, yeah, it's a humbling experience. Mm. Yeah, it almost sounds as though there's a place for intermediaries, Aboriginal or not, where they could mm. interface with the linguistic work, interface with the community, and just bring it to the right level. Yeah. So, and there is that sort of work. So, there are language centres around Australia with with linguists or people who are trained in linguistics, who, but who are working with community, and and that's actually a big part of their role is to yeah. is to you know take the linguistic resources and then. I don't know if translates the role, interpret them, change them into formats to to suit the sort of goals of the specific community. So th- and so they play a really important role in that respect. Awesome, yeah. and we like to focus on them as well. Living languages also super good. Mm-hmm. At Living doing this. languages is another good example. Yes, exactly. All right, I want to talk about this work that you've done, but I want to approach it from the viewpoint of me as an English speaker. Mm-hmm. Because I want to talk about what happens when I'm putting a sentence together. So I speak English, and if you show me a picture like a crocodile is about to bite a person, and you ask me, Mm -hmm. make an utterance that describes what's going on in this scene. Mm -hmm. As an English speaker, I'm more or less obligated to start with the subject, because that's kind of an English... Actually, it's it's a most languages thing. Mm -hmm. And since the crocodile is doing the biting, that seems like a, a good choice. What is going on with me and my body and my perception when I'm making that choice to start with the crocodile? Yeah, well, so what we know is that when you look at a picture and you're planning your sentence, the first thing you need to do is, well, look at the picture and uh, form what, the, so uh, psycholinguists talk about sentence production, which is what we're talking about. So, so planning to produce a sentence. As, as happening in sort of incremental stages. So the first stage is the event apprehension stage or the sort of conceptual formulation stage, so where you're, you're sort of building the concept or preparing the concept or the, uh, getting an understanding of the event of what you're going to say. And then you move information into the linguistic formulation stage, which is where in your brain you start to seek the the actual linguistic constructions that you're going to use to express this uh, concept, mm-hmm. and then you move once you've once you've sought those linguistic elements, you then move them to speech production, and you you start to produce them. Now this sort of happens incrementally, but it but it can be sort of going on concurrently. So you can you could potentially, as an English speaker, what what it seems like most people do is mm-hmm. they look at the picture and in the event apprehension stage, they very quickly decide which element is going to be the subject. They look primarily at the subject at that stage and presumably send that information down to linguistic encoding and say, all right, get ready to express <laughs> crocodile, right? <laughs> you know, find, <laughs> find the right word and, you know, get it all ready. Uh, that's heads out to speech production. While that's happening, you, you're then looking at the rest of the picture and going, okay, after that, I need to think about biting and then you're sending that down and so on. I mean, this is obviously a very simplistic characterization of how it works, but that's the basic idea. Right. So um, earlier studies uh, along the lines of what we did looked at languages like English and what they found is that if you show an English speaker, the picture of that crocodile biting someone or about to bite a man. Mm -hmm. In the very early stages, when they first see the picture, so we're talking about the first 600 milliseconds after they see the picture. So Mm -hmm. it's like like a period of time that is sort of subconscious. We don't even realise we're doing it. And in that first 600 milliseconds, what you find is that English speakers look primarily at the part of the picture that they then express as the subject. So in this case, they look primarily at the crocodile. How do you know what I'm looking at, by the way? Have you hired lots of poor little student assistants who have to look at people's eyes? (laughs) No, no, not that. Um, There is now this sophisticated technology called an eye tracker. And what an eye tracker does is 
That's a good name. Film, basically. It's like a little video camera, I suppose, and it's super sophisticated and it can zoom right in on your, I guess it's your pupils or, you know, the key elements of your eye (laughs) and measure where you're looking on the screen, basically. So it's the eye tracker that tells us where you're looking. So here I am, the English speaker, and in the first 600 milliseconds, I have, is it the kind of thing where my eyes dart around the entire picture and then I go, oh, crocodile, that's going to be significant. Is that, would that be kind of what we see? Uh, well, it's really hard because these these studies are done over, over uh, say, 50 speakers, right? So what we're looking at is the sort of average looks across a whole mm-hmm. group of speakers because the it's not... Um, statistics, the statistics don't really work very well on just one speaker. But essentially what we, what we see is that you might do a few little looks across the rest of the picture, yes, but you're primarily in that time as an English speaker really just looking at the subject. Okay. You're just really looking at that going, oh, okay, that's a crocodile. I need to let linguistic encoding know to find the word for that. Okay. Um, it on get it ready all right well that sounds pretty plausible that um we'd be looking at the one was going to be the subject what why could anyone do it any other way right so what the previous research did as people in this sort of paradigm said well what if we look at languages that have other word orders so english has a particular order in which it likes to put words in the sentence subject goes first Uh, But, of course, not all languages do that. So other research looked at Celtal, which is a language where the verb likes to go first. And so what they said is, well, let's do the same study and let's look at what Celtal speakers do because they don't have to get their subject out first. They have to primarily get their verb out first. So what do they do when they're planning their sentences? And what they found was that Celtal speakers look much more evenly across the whole picture. So they had a more even distribution of looks to subject and object Mm. in that first 600 milliseconds, not the huge number of looks to subject like English speakers had. And what they concluded from that was that because Celtal speakers have to get the verb out first, they sort of need to work out what the whole event is. They need to, you know, in order to know what the verb is, you need to know what's happening in the whole picture. So you need to look Mm -hmm. more evenly across all the participants or subject object participants in the picture to get a sense of the event so that you can get your verb out first. Mm -hmm. And so this supports the idea that grammatical properties of the language that we speak might actually influence the way in which we process and do language in the brain. And so that's why this sort of research is interesting because a lot of psycholinguistic research has been based primarily on European languages, languages that tend to do things in the same way. And Mm -hmm. so people had proposed universals about how language processing is done. But in fact, what this sort of research is suggesting is that it may not be the same for everybody. It might depend on the grammatical properties of the language you're speaking, and that might actually play a role in uh, how you go about planning and producing your sentences in an interesting way. Okay. So that was the context in which we got the idea to look at languages that we find in Australia where there is no fixed word order. How how do you mean? Okay. So uh, English is a language where um, we have, you know, subjects have to go first in the sentence and then you have your verb and then you have your object. So um, crocodile bites man means uh, something very different from man bites crocodile, right? True. Um, and then Celtal is a language where the verb tends to go first. So you would say, you know, bites and then talk about the rest of the sentence. Mm-hmm. In many Australian languages, including Murimpata, which is the language we looked at initially, in many Australian languages, there isn't a fixed order in which you have to put those things in the sentence. You could say crocodile bites man. You could say man bites crocodile. You could say bites crocodile man, bites man crocodile. Any of those options would mean the same thing. 
and would be grammatical. How do they know the difference between man bites crocodile and crocodile bites man? So sometimes it's context, but in a lot of languages, it's things like case marking, where uh, nouns carry information about what role they're playing in the sentence. So that's what you find in Pitten Data, which is another language that we looked at. Um, in a language like Murimpata, it's information that's marked on the verb telling you properties about the subject and properties about the object. So there are just other ways that the language encodes this information instead of word order. Mm. Right? So English just chooses to do it with word order, as do many languages, but you don't have to. You can do mm. it in other ways and keep your word order free. It's actually quite a lot. In that respect, it's a lot like Latin, for example. Latin had very free word order. And in fact, Old English did as well. So, you know, it's it's in European history too, even though it sort of feels very different. Um, but Australian languages are sort of well known for having an order of freedom that we don't find commonly in other languages of the world, where mm -hmm. there really is a lot of flexibility in how you can order these things in the sentence. But it's sort of like if, if in the language you need to somehow signal who does what to who, you can distribute that job to different little workers and you can have your little word order worker who does the job or you can have your little markers on the verb that does the job or you can have mm -hmm. little markers mm -hmm. on the noun or you can have all of them combined. And in some settings like where you can often assume that it's very common that crocodiles bite man than the other way around, mm -hmm. you might be able to be a bit more ambiguous than otherwise. But if in such a world, all of a sudden, surprise, surprise, the stone is speaking to the girl, you might mm -hmm. pay a bit more attention to getting them all in line. Yeah, or if a person bites a crocodile, that would be strange. So we better we better be just... strange. But Queensland is a big place with a lot of funny people <laughs> in it. Indeed there are. <laughs> is this what we're talking yes. about? We're talking about Queensland? This is where they speak Murimpata? No, Northern Territory, actually. I'm just referring to like the Florida man trope of Queensland man. You are no? absolutely correct, and I have no issue with that comparison. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Northern Territory for Murimpata. Yeah, mm -hmm. okay. yeah, Northern Territory. So we thought, well, if the order in which you put words in a sentence influences the way you process that and plan that sentence, what happens if there isn't any fixed order to put words in, mm -hmm. in your language? We thought maybe what we would find is it's just sort of random and some people do the English sort of thing and some people do the telltale thing or maybe we would find that it all just looks like English anyway. We didn't know what it would look like, but we thought, well, that seems to be an interesting question. So we thought we would find out for okay. sure. <laughs> that sounds like the perfect way of coming up with a good research question, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you got a bunch of Murimpata speakers. What, uh, what was the process like working with them? Well, it was fabulous. I've worked with um, Murimpata speakers for, well, 15 or so years at that point, so I knew people pretty well. Another aspect of this research that's a little bit new was that we took all of the equipment into the field. Usually this psycholinguistic research is done in a lab sort of situation People mm -hmm. come into a to a lab and there's all this fancy equipment set up and it, the experiments run there. We took um, a portable eye tracker and uh, computers with the experiment on it to Waria, where Murimpata speaking people live, and conducted it there with 50, well, we were I think we ended up with 46 in the end, Murimpata speakers. And we just showed them, they just sat and looked at the, computer screen and pictures would come up and we would just ask them to tell us what's happening in the picture. So yeah. it was a very easy sort of uh, task for them to do. And the eye tracker kept track of where they were looking on the screen and we recorded their responses. And then later the analysis was to then have a look at what correlations we could find between what they did in the first 600 milliseconds of seeing the picture and which element or which participant they produced first in their response. I've got to guess, even though I've kind of looked over this, but uh, Hevig 
What do you think happened? Let's make a prediction. I didn't look over this. It's 6.30 a.m. and I'm teaching my, I'm responsible for a full university course for the first time in my life. So I'm not doing anything <laughs> besides the bare minimum. Daniel told me to oh, show so you up. Want me to tell you? Use. No, no, no I want to guess. Make her guess. Make her guess. Make her guess. <laughs> okay, so. What do you think we found? Well, I feel like the default ought to be the whole that sell pal the whole event frame thing. Yeah. Because then you gotta select your verb and that's kinda important. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. But now you got now you got free reign. You can you can pick whatever you want. Yeah. But then Rachel said that people have free word order, but what if some orders are more common? I was wondering about that too. Is you that right? You can do any order, but people tend to put the subject first. Yeah. Well this even before we got to the eye tracking data this part was interesting because yes. yes we describe it as free word order but in principle i mean that doesn't you know i guess we didn't know what people were going to do in an experiment mm -hmm. so even if your language was free word order you might just why wouldn't you just pick one order and just do that all the way through you've got to describe 95 pictures or whatever it ended up being so mm -hmm. maybe you just do that just pick the svo order and do that all the way through or maybe um, people would just, you know, everyone would do something different. Each person would do a different order. Or we just, we didn't know. What mm -hmm. we found actually was a lot of word order variation. So we found that every word order was used. Uh, we found that each speaker used an average, um, a mean of 545 orders across the experiment so there was no one who just stuck to one the same speaker mm -hmm. oh my gosh that's yeah. so yeah. fun that's so fun yeah that's wild yeah so that part even before we got to the eye tracking uh data that that was super exciting because what we really found was this real flexibility of word order that mm -hmm. we'd sort of always said was there but this was a really great way of seeing it in real life, in real time, Be because every every picture is different. So there was no context. There's no building up of a narrative. There's nothing. Yeah, it's yeah. just purely each one. Yeah. Do you have any insight as to why people just don't converge? I, I always think of language as being like a regularizing force, and we tend to do things. I know that there's variation, and we we have a number of choices, but man, it seems like if we want things to be easy, we standardize, but they haven't. No, they haven't. I mean, we found some tendencies. So we found that, that humanness, so we, our, our pictures were varied mm -hmm. intentionally, varied for human participants and non-human participants and who was acting yeah. on who and so on. Um, and we did find that there was a preference to putting humans earlier first in the okay. sentence. Not, yeah. not yeah. absolute, not everyone did that, but uh, it, so often if a human was an object, so some, so mm -hmm. like the crocodile biting the man, for example, mm -hmm. you would get more responses with the man first. Mm -hmm. um, so there right. seems to be a preference to putting humans uh, first in sentence. So we did find some mm -hmm. tendencies, but, yeah, a lot of it, at least from what we can tell in the experiment, I mean, we can only access so much of I mean, what mm -hmm. people are thinking, but from what, we, you know, for, to the extent that we can determine in the experiment, a lot of it just seemed to be, I don't know, random, free choice. Why mm. not? You got all those word orders. Why not? It's a party. We did think, well, maybe people are just mentioning the thing they, their eyes happen to land on first because yeah. that's another okay. possibility. If you've got free word order, maybe you just, Whatever you see first, well, that comes out first. <laughs> Boom. And you varied them. So sometimes the, the mouse biting the cheese, I don't know if you had that, but sometimes the mouse was on the left side of yeah. the screen and sometimes it was on the right side of the screen. Yeah, and we switched. We also, um, across participants, uh, had two versions of the experiment. So different participants saw the same picture but in reverse so yeah. that that sort oh. of controlled, controlled for that. So good. We didn't find any significant correlation between where people looked first in the picture and which element they produced first. So that didn't seem to be part of that's, it. Mm. That's surprising. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But to get back to your earlier question, there were certainly mm -hmm. some orders that were more common than others. Mm -hmm. So having s your subject first was 
that like more responses had the subject first. Um, mm-hmm. The most common order that we found in the Murimpatha experiment was subject, verb, object, which is like yeah. what we have in English. But even so, that was still under 50% of responses. So it wasn't a majority response. It was just mm-hmm. our most common one. Did they also mm. speak English? I'm thinking interference. Well, we wondered about that. Um, they don't, I mean, yes, people can speak some English, but the Murimpatha speakers that we, well, all, all the Murimpatha speakers in Wadia grow up with Murimpatha as their primary language and mm-hmm. competencies in English vary across the population. That wasn't something we could really control for. Okay. But mm-hmm. even if it was an English influence, it still was way under, well, under 50% of responses. So it doesn't really get us very far in terms of accounting for the variation. Okay. Well, so yeah. Hedvig, your guess was that they would be sort of looking all around during the first 600 milliseconds. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. And But then I think when they chose a thing, when they finally landed on a thing, they would like hone in on that. But we're only talking about the first 600 milliseconds. So whatever they hone in on later, we're not thinking about. That's true. All right. I'm, I'm ready. I'm well, damp with you're... anticipation. <laughs> what, was, what was exciting is you're both right. So in 600 milliseconds, right, which is just the tiniest amount of time, mm-hmm. in 600 milliseconds, Murimpatha speakers looked across the whole event just like cell tile speakers do, but they did it much faster and much earlier and mm-hmm. then made a decision about the word order they were going to use and then started to look at the element, the subject or the object that they were going to produce first. So mm-hmm. in 600 milliseconds, they do the cell tile thing and the English thing effectively. They, they look across the whole event, decide what word order they're going to use, and then start to primarily look at the thing they're going to say first. Hmm. Right. Which was sort of extraordinary because that's a lot to be doing in 600 milliseconds. So in the experiment, in the, in the condition where the crocodile bit the man, they looked all over the scene, and then uh, man is the most human-y thing. So they pretended to say that first. So then they looked at the man and they say man, crocodile bit, and then they do Marcus and things so you know who's biting him. Yeah, basically. I mean, not everyone did exactly the same, but that the you know overall tendency is yes. So they would look across both participants. So that's sort of that's the closest we can get to assuming they're looking across the whole scene. But you know, they they, they would look evenly, relatively evenly across. You know, man, crocodile, man, crocodile, man, crocodile, man, crocodile, man, crocodile, man, 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 because they decide that's what they're going to say first. And then mm, all of okay. that happens in, in 600 milliseconds once they've seen the picture. And they don't actually say anything for, I think the average speech onset time was something more like one and a half or even closer to two seconds. So they're doing mm-hmm. all this work really quickly, but then... You know, they're not speaking straight away. Then there's more, all the linguistic encoding work and stuff still happens, but they've worked out a plan very quickly in the first 600 milliseconds. Wow. Well, it takes a long time to get all of your speech organs and everything in a row. Yeah. And so we were very excited by this result because it showed, well, it suggested that um, the speakers were doing something different to what had been found for English speakers and cell tile speakers and all of the other languages that uh, this experiment had been done with. But then we thought, well, maybe it's not about the freedom of word order. Maybe it's because Murimpatha has these really big, complex verbs. And because the verb carries all this morphology telling you who the subject is and the object and all this sort of stuff has to get put together in the verb, we thought, well, maybe that's why they're doing this. Maybe it's not about the free word order. Maybe it's a mm-hmm. bit like the cell tile effect where because you've got to deal with this big, complex verb, yeah, that's why you're looking quickly across the scene and, and getting it sorted early. Yeah. So then we thought, well, we'll look at a different language. We looked at Pitindara, which is another Australian language with very flexible word order but has very simple verbs, more like English verbs, and has nouns with case marking on them. Mm-hmm. So we thought, well, let's have a look at Pitindara and see what happens there. 
So pit and data is a very different language. Like verbs are different, nouns are different, it works very differently. The mm-hmm. only thing really it shares with Murempatha is having this flexible word order. And we ran the same experiment with pit and data speakers, had a look at what they were doing, and it was exactly the same as the Murempatha speakers. So it was nice. that was super exciting. So they were again doing this really early rapid what's called relational encoding by the psycholinguist so that's where you look across both participants in the scene um fairly evenly in that event apprehension stage Mm -hmm. they were doing that really rapidly then deciding which word order they were going to produce because they started to look primarily at the thing that they mentioned first so you know it was the same so that was that was pretty cool so that's really cool Mm. what a cool result we love to talk on this show about like experiments and how to control for things. And it sounds like you've done such a thorough work with so many of things like varying like humanness or varying order. And it sounds like you were so lucky to have both uh, Munipata and Pithanjara that you could do this on, that you could compare them like this. It seems so fortunate yeah, yeah. for figuring out the logic of the research question. So yeah, so satisfying. all of the experimental design and all, as you say, it was very carefully worked out and thought through. All of that is due to my colleague and collaborator, Evan Kidd, Professor Evan Kidd at ANU. So he was the, or is the psycholinguist on the project. And all of that is due to him because I had never designed experiments or done this before. So um, he had that all very carefully and thoroughly worked out to control for all those different elements and yeah we we well i guess it was by design that we chose to look at pit and data next because we wanted a language that was so different but yeah we were lucky that we had someone so that was sasha wilmoth who is a phd student was a phd student of mine at the time who was able to run that experiment for us in Pitandata. So it really sort of rounded it off nicely and made us feel quite confident in saying that I, I guess what we feel like this data is showing us is that speaking a language with free or flexible word order puts a particular pressure on the processing system that requires you to uh, make these decisions and do this part of your planning very, very quickly, um, much more so than in a language that has a much more fixed word order like English or Celta. Mm-hmm. Well, I was going to f- ask if it's possible to flip it and say that English puts a lot of pressure forcing people to look at subjects and that if we didn't have that, we would be looking at the entire scene. And I don't know which one is less pressured now that I think, I don't know which one is cognitively harder. Yeah. I guess I didn't, yeah, I, I didn't necessarily, when I said, pressure that might have been the wrong word i didn't mean to suggest that that there's a negative you know hardness about that but just more that the the consequence mm-hmm. of speaking Effects. a free word or yeah. a language is that you your processing system needs to work in a certain way and mm-hmm. you need to uh that therefore leads you to look much more quickly across the event early on because you've got to then make your decisions about what order you're going to use and so you need to pack that all in much earlier i guess yeah yeah yeah. it just kind of amazes me about planning and utterance you know we we get situations thrown at us that we've never seen before we launch into sentences with the scantiest of looks at what it is that we're talking about and when we launch into a sentence we, it, it feels to me like we just have no idea how the sentence is going to end it's something we work out in progress concurrently with all the other cognitive stuff that we're doing it's really amazing that's true it is really amazing and obviously we need to remember that we were getting people to do this in a very constrained context right which where they've seen a picture and they're describing a picture so actually in real speech where you're sort of planning as you go and there isn't any script about what you're going to say or describe i guess that's (laughs) going to be even even harder in that way yeah I want to ask about um, the reporting on this because the Scientific American article, there's going to be a link in the show notes for this episode. Uh, Here's Mm -hmm. the title. Grammar changes how we see an Australian language shows, Uh, which, you know, they decided to lean into the Worfian angle, the idea that language influences our thought. Mm -hmm. And linguists are 
typically kind of allergic to this idea. How valid do you think it is that that language can have uh, can reach into our thinking? Because this work certainly sounds like it's the language we speak having an influence on what we notice. And I mean, some of that is language because we're using uh, our language influences our language planning. Duh. Mm -hmm. But also, mm -hmm. you know, language is sort of helping us make decisions about what we do. Do you think that this is a good example of maybe something that's slightly wharf adjacent? Um, I think we, you know, I'm sort of channeling um, my collaborator, Evan Kidd, here as I say this, but I think we would be very, very hesitant to draw anything from our results beyond what we tested in the experiment. So, you know, the, the okay. reality is we were asking people to do a linguistic exercise and we looked at how they did that linguistic exercise. So really we don't know anything beyond how, what they do to plan their sentences. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I guess it means, it depends what you mean by thought. I mean, that is still part of thinking, you know, to plan your sentence, you still need to, you know, that, that's an aspect of thinking. So in that sense, we have shown that uh, the language you speak influences the way in which you think when you're planning your sentence mm -hmm. um, in that way. But I wouldn't want to say that we've suggested anything beyond that. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, in the article, it was drawn upon as one interesting example, um, but she also talked about other things that, that other research that um, perhaps gets a bit closer to Warfian ideas. Um, mm. But, yeah, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have pushed the Warfian angle, but journalists, you know, take things to attract, I mean, they have to, right? That Like, yeah. that's what makes people excited. In the attention economy. Yeah, that's what yep. makes people think about it a bit, yeah. I should have mentioned the author, Christine Kennelly in Scientific American. And, and also, like, um, Rachel and Evan might want to downplay it, but, like, it, it, we talk in the 600 first milliseconds. We don't think that this structures, like, how Munipatha speakers in general think about actors or, like, how they think about people in the world or anything like that. We're just saying, oh, when they look at people or when they look at things in the first 600 milliseconds, they tend to look a bit more like this. And that could be influenced mm. by the language planning they're about to do. Um, so you could call it a very, very, very tiny linguistic relativity effect mm -hmm. and then just sort of spread that sort of scientific mid midway maybe by saying, like, it's a tiny effect, but sure, you can call it an effect if you want. But probably because people with linguistic relativity also want to say, like, oh, and that's why French people are better at diplomacy or something. Like, they, they want to, like, yeah. call yeah. it, like – really 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 far um but maybe there's a place for like tiny ones yeah yeah that's the aspect of warfianism that i object to is this sort of that language has a spooky effect on your thinking like if your language has a certain grammatical setup if you have grammatical gender then you're going to be worse at having you're going to have less women in the workforce or something like that i think mm. we all object to that and i think that's the work that isn't very strong what I want to get away from, though, is us going, that's not a thing. And then when it turns out to kind of be a little thing, sort of, then we go, scoff, that's not a real example because blah, and I'm still right. I don't want to do that. I want to say, I want to give it a fair hearing. I want to say, yeah, maybe some of these spooky examples are, are not very good. The evidence for them isn't very good. But, you know, maybe we could say, yeah, tiny effect in this one way which not coincidentally also pertains to language. Yeah, well, I mean, I think there is no doubt, for me anyway, uh, but I don't think it would be controversial, that language, the language you speak has an influence on things that you pay attention to when you're talking about them, right? Yeah. So if you speak a language with gendered pronouns, like English, well, we're, we're hopefully getting better at, at getting used to non-gendering them, but traditionally in English, English has had very gendered pronouns. And if you speak a language with gendered pronouns, you have to be paying attention to people's gender so that you know which pronoun to use, right? If you mm -hmm. speak a language that doesn't have gendered pronouns, then you don't have to be paying attention to their gender. It doesn't mean that you don't understand gender or you don't notice what gender people might be, 
but it does mean that you don't have to pay attention to that every single time you speak. So there's no doubt that speaking Mm -hmm. a language and like languages with their grammatical structures force their speakers to pay attention to certain things. In Murimpata, every time you talk about a group of people, grammatically on the verb, you have to encode whether those people are related to each other as siblings or not, Hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So you can't talk about a group of people without paying attention to the kinship relations between the group of people you're talking about. Mm -hmm. We don't have to do that in English, right? It doesn't mean that I don't, I can't think about people's relationships or I, I don't understand that these people are brother and sister. It, it just means I'm not forced to think about that every time I say something. So I think that's the level where language really does influence the way you have to talk about the world because it forces you to pay attention to certain things just to get the grammar right. We've been talking to Professor Rachel Norlinger from the University of Melbourne. Rachel, thanks so much for hanging out with us and talking today. Thanks so much. It was really great fun. It's time for Words of the Week, and the first word of the week that I've got, I've just been noticing these things, and here's one. Third places. Have you heard of this one? I have. Oh, you found one of my one of my little... Uh, I don't, you, do you know what? We need to come up with a word for the thing I'm about to describe. Yeah? Weird... Not, not habits. Weird things that you find yourself watching a lot of on YouTube. Yes. Right? Like, like so, so I've, it's I've been, yeah, yeah. Like I've been on a YouTube groove now for a while on like urban planning. Yes. I know you have. Yeah. 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 So there's a great, I think I've even mentioned it before. There's a great. And you um, said nothing. You didn't even tell me about this one. Sorry. Go on. <laughs> so, well, it's, you don't, this is the thing when you're in a groove, right? You don't know how much to info dump. And like you and I both, I think, share a bit of a quality where we can get on a real roll and then far too late in the process start to clock that the other person does not give a fuck about what we're talking about. <laughs> so, so it's, it's hard to know yes. when to like woe yourself in, but. If anyone is interested in urban planning and urban design, there is a wonderful creator on YouTube who has a channel called Not Just Bikes, and that's where I ran across this term. They talk about third places in urban design. And that, that's sort of where the co- concept comes from in like- Yeah, um, so- Not just urban design, sorry, but in, in civil Like civil social design. design. Or, so yeah, what is this thing? Design. I'd never heard of it before. In our horrendous- post-apocalyptic capitalist hellscape universe that so many of us exist in, there's basically two places for us. There is home and there is work. And if you're a kid, work is school. It's just the same thing, but it's a different, right? Like you go to the thing and then you come home and you go to the thing and then you come home. Third places are places other than those two places. And Mm. in the best version of society, or at least in societies where like, metrics of health and well-being are really high and like crime and antisocial behavior are really low third places tend to be extremely well activated zones of human activity so they are things like parks and recreation centers and And clubs yeah clubs the thing you find in a lot of places not just in europe but all around the world is like town squares Mm -hmm. are often really 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 good third places where you can just be Mm. and you can interact with the world around you in a way that is like pro-social you can maybe do like the reason why town squares are so good is you can do like a little bit of shopping as in for like essentials food and that sort of thing Mm. you can um run into people they'll often be people like dancing and 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 doing all sorts of like fun activities like that and crucially really really crucially in the west in our as aforementioned capitalist end of times hellscape is that third places also kind of need to be free as well, right? So uh, the wet, like in Australia, we have heaps of third pay- places. They just cost money, right? Bars cost a lot of money to be at. Um, health clubs or like country clubs or sports clubs or whatever, right, cost money to be part of. You have to be a member often. Um, so third places have been largely co-opted by sort of like profit-oriented capitalist living. Mm, okay. um, and in- really, really, really spread out suburban places, like America's really bad for it, Australia's really bad for it, um, Canada's really bad for it. Third places are just not a thing in a mm. lot of places. 
and it makes us not happy as human beings. We don't like it. We don't know we don't like it, but we don't like it. They don't really exist, but they used to. Like I see Big time. Freemason clubs or, you know, like Elks clubs. I mean, I guess that's- <laughs> Also, I've got to say for the people listening, they don't just have to be weird culty things either. Right? Like they can they can be just yes. normal. But as we saw with Lisa the Iconoclast, how are you to keep a population together <laughs> unless it's by a, a tangled mythology of lies and half-truths? <laughs> how else are you going to do it, Ben? Uh, Can't do true. it with facts. It's true. That doesn't it's make true. you feel special. Facts don't give you any secret knowledge. Well, all I can say is the Netherlands exists and they don't have weird stonemasons everywhere. It's always the Netherlands. <laughs> they just keep doing it really well. The only uncomfortable thing is everyone's Dutch. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ow, had, had to, hey. Had to, had to. Okay. All right. So third place is um, necessary, you know, because- Essential. They help to boost public participation, public trust- and that's those are great things. Okay, next one. Have you run across this word when? I mean, W H E N, but it could also be W E N. Nope. Well, I'm just going to read some examples here. This is one from Steam. Somebody wrote about a game. Next update when? W E N. <laughs> okay. I, I have you run I across this? I feel like I see what's coming across here. Here's one from Broadway. Uh, it's a photo of William Jackson Harper and Kristen Bell who were in The Good Place together. And this is on our Broadway on Reddit about Little Shop of Horrors. This Little Shop casting, when? Three question marks. It pops up in the Tesla community a lot. When next gen? That's when's the next generation vehicle. $300 when? So we're seeing when being used in different ways. What's your analysis here? Reminds me of, and I'm going to date myself here a little bit. Um, get out, get out your uh, your smoking pipes, uh, fellow older internet denizens. I'm ready. This reminds me of I can has cheeseburger language. <laughs> it's lolcat. It is. It is giving me. It's. It, it is giving. It's giving lolcat. lolcat vibes. It is for sure. It is. I I can have when. So it's one of those things where. Picking out words of the week is hard because the natural ones just sink right down into bedrock and you just sort of use them. You often don't recognize them as new or breaking words at all. Mm. And so I only gradually do I become aware of it. So, sort of like Homer Simpson in when, when he hears dental plan. You know. <laughs> Listen, it's crazy. <laughs> only gradually does it dawn on me. So this one is interesting grammatically because usually you have when... Like a sentence like, when does the market open? You have when, and then an auxiliary verb, and then whatever. When does the market open? But lately, when, or when with a W-E-N, is getting stuck on before or after just a predicate or just a noun phrase, like when market open, or market open when. And I think this is interesting because it's kind of doing what because was doing when we started just sticking it on to noun phrases, uh, because race car, because language. And that was so interesting to us that we named a whole fucking podcast after it. I thought it was great. In 2017, I was walking down the street and then I had the idea for that name. And I thought, holy crap, I've got to check and see if anybody's got it. And nobody did. So that is a case of when shifting a little bit, showing some grammatical shift. Pretty cool. I like that. Okay. Next, next one suggested by Diego. Blue card. Ben. Is, is this sports ball? You and I are such sports ball fanatics. I wonder that we don't talk about it more on the show, but we are <laughs> avid enthusiasts of any kind of sports ball. Definitely. And I know people who like sports are listening to this and being like, oh, not these fuckers who just like hate sport. Look, I get it. I get you like the thing and we hate the thing. That's fine. Yeah. It's just, I, I just, I cannot muster up any fucks to give about sport. I'm sorry. That's it's just right. really it's boring. It's fine. It doesn't mean that we're better or anything. It's just no, there are tons of I things that we are into that, that nobody else cares about, right? It's, people it's like fun. punk music. I don't like punk music. It's just not my, it's not my jam. I yes. don't hate people who like punk. You gave it a shot. It's fine. Yep. So this one, uh, there's a headline from ESPN. Blue cards to be introduced for football sin bin trials. So my limited understanding of yes. football slash soccer, depending on what part of the world you're coming from. Um, it's the International Football Association Board. That's soccer, isn't it? It's professional football, but I think they mean soccer. Yes. Okay, let's well, keep the, going. The story has soccer in the HTML, so I'm going to call it soccer. 
Um, okay. You do know you're a sports ball. <laughs> <laughs> My understanding of that sport is that there is a yellow card, which yep. is a warning, uh, yep. like a serious warning, though, that's like a yellow card and then a red card. And you can acquire yellow cards, I think, and if I think maybe two or three, and then you get a red card. And a red card is very, very bad because then you get sent off, um, but yep. you don't get sent off and replaced. So your team will have to play one oh. player down if someone gets red carded. Okay, um, that sucks. Yes. Uh, like, so it's a very significant penalty. Like even okay. people like us who don't know sports ball are like, if 11 people are now playing 10 people, 11 people definitely have an advantage. <laughs> well, this is not as bad as a red card. A blue card is for when you have bad behavior because we are living in the as Holocene and we are- <laughs> not heard that word before that should go on the um word of the week list oh that was on the american dialect society last year but we didn't get to do it with grant but anyway this blue card is if you're rude to an official or you attack another player but it's not bad enough for a red card you get a blue card and there are penalties for that like i think you move the ball 10 yards toward the goal or you have to run around and touch every seat before you get to come back and play or something like that let me actually click through on this link because that sounds to me like um, exactly what a yellow card exists to do. Okay. So I want to see what the difference is because I'm assuming people who actually know soccer will find our analysis so far deeply unsatisfying. Yeah, the article uh, might not help you, but, but go ahead and read what they got. Control F, everyone's favourite. Okay. Grassroots football in England, which is a particular problem with referee abuse from players, has been using the yellow card to indicate the offence across 31 leagues since the 2019-2020 season. Right. The IFAB wanted a different colour to be distinct to players, coaches, and supporters, and has chosen blue. They wanted a oh. different colour. Okay. Okay. So I guess it's oh. not the same as a yellow card. I guess it's no. Like, it is the same. They've just decided the same. to use a blue blue card. one. I think if that's what I'm, fans won't be seeing the blue card in top level competitions like the Premier League or UEFA um, or the Euros. Okay. So you're um, having the same reaction I had, and that is, it, is that different? I read it like five times. Okay, and so I can I can pass a little bit of this. Okay. So. This is um, funny. <laughs> this is hilarious. <laughs> blue cards have been brought in by IFAB, which is the International Federation, the International Football Association Board. IFAB, it's really important to note, is not FIFA. It is not UEFA, and it is not the Premier League. So okay. <laughs> there are really, really, really big soccer entities that govern a whole bunch of soccer. Blah, 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 magnesium. <laughs> yeah. So there's a bunch of bodies that govern soccer that are not doing this. So yes. it is a relatively small part of the soccer world. Small but not insignificant. And they're trying it out. They're trying and it out to see how it goes. They've, they've decided to use a blue card instead of a yellow card. I don't know if you can, why. If you can help us out, then go ahead and get to us. Hello at becauselanguage.com. <laughs> I, would, I would genuinely, actually, that is a genuine actual question. I can't believe this is happening. I now am curious about a sports thing. So if you're listening to this and you're like, I can answer that question. I know, I know why they're using blue instead of yellow, because it seems to me like the yellow card exists and they've just chosen to do a blue one instead. Come and, come and tell me. I'd be really interested to know. Ben's curious about a sports thing. I don't even know yep. who he is anymore. I saw I saw a horseman flying earlier today. Last one. This one was suggested by Lissa on Facebook, who says, How do we feel about my friend who maybe coined the term flyroglyphics? Are we just are we just allowing random shit our friends say into word of the week now? Where do you think the rest of them have come from? Not like, that. A flyroglyphic it's stuff we see in the wild. A flyroglyphic would be a term like P-E-R for Perth or B-N-E for whatever that airport is. Okay. They're actually called I-A-T-A airport codes. And Ben, I know how much you love that weird flight matrix tool that you found. <laughs> so you know a little bit about this. We've, wow. You've, you've really like custom built a list of like bizarre shit ben does in his free time on stuff the internet ben likes yep it's more i actually find a lot of this stuff more shameful than like gross kinky sex shit like i, I like like people will come across me doing something on my laptop and be like ben what are you doing i'll slam it close and be like porn because <laughs> it's because it's, it's better 
It's better than having to say, I, I've, I found an interesting search tool for flights that allow you to restrict the flight by aircraft manufacturer code. And like, that's more embarrassing to me than sex stuff. <laughs> I found out a little bit about why these fly hieroglyphics, these IATA airport codes are so weird because they don't always match the city. They don't. Well, I imagine because you only have a limited, like three letters is not very many letters. <laughs> Well, that's and true, so but there's there's more to it than that even. Okay. So in the USA, they started off using a two-letter code used by the National Weather Service. Didn't they learn their lessons from the States? They did not. <laughs> and then they would add letters like an X. So that's why LA, Los Angeles is LAX, Portland is PDX, and Phoenix is PHX. Okay, Phoenix does have an X in it, but that X is not the X in Phoenix. It's the X in we're adding an extra letter to PH. That's um, dumb. <laughs> also, the U.S. Navy got all of the N codes. So a city that started with N didn't get to use N. So Newark, New Jersey is EWR. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, in Canada, a lot of the fly hieroglyphics start with Y, whether the name of the place starts with Y or not. Okay. And the reason for that is that if the airport had a weather station, they would add a Y, as in yes, to show that it did have a weather station associated oh. with that airport. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah, so like what is uh what is Montreal? I I looked this up. Y M T or Y M N or something? It's Y U L. So just a funny bit of cultural hold over there. And then of course there are a lot of codes that are the same. For example, story time. Flying to Salt Lake City, where's my luggage? Got diverted. Seattle. No, it didn't go to SLC. It went to S C L. Okay. Santiago, Chile. Oh, no. Santiago no. International Airport. That's where it went. That's rough. Yeah, but at least they paid for me to get new stuff. I still love my airport shoes. I still wear them. <laughs> anyway. Lyroglyphics. I don't hate it. I kind of like it. Thanks, Lissa, for that one. So, third place is when blue card and flyroglyphics are words of the week. Just like to say a big thank you to Dr. Rachel Nordlinger. Big thank you to Speech Docs, who transcribes all the words that we make. Thanks to you, patrons, for being awesome. And Ben, thanks to you for being here and hanging out with me. Really appreciate Gosh, you. Oh, shucks. Thanks to you for doing literally everything on the show. But also thanks to the other squad of human beings who do so many things, including like a lot of our show ideas and that sort of stuff, our patrons, who hang out on Discord and do the absolute level, wickedest job at keeping things interesting and telling us about stuff and also just being legends. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at any amount of money that you like. Um, it starts very, very cheap and you can be on our Discord and get access to our shows as they come out and a bunch of other stuff that's really, really cool. And we just did a whole bunch of mail outs as well. So if you like knickknacks and patty wax, you should become a patron because you will get Daniel sending you things in the mail. And certain patrons even get a shout out. Those patrons are Termi, Elias, Matt, Whitney, Helen, Jack, Farrowcat, Lord, Lord Mortis, Mortis, Lissa, Grammarian, Renee, Christopher, Andy, James, Nigel, Meredith, Kate, Nazrin, Joanna, Nikolai, Keith, Aisha, who's a babe, Steele, Margareth, Manu, Diego, Aria Flame, Roger, Rianne, Colleen, Ignacio, Kevin, Andy from Logophilius, Stan, Kathy, Rash, Cheyenne, Felicity, Amir, Kenny Archer, oh, oh Tim. Tim, Alyssa, Chris, Angry Balls, Tig, Louise, Rainer, and new this time, Tony with a yearly membership. Oh, did the whole calendar year. Good on you, mate. And let's not forget our new patron, Itamar. Thanks to all our lovely, wonderful patrons. We mentioned Itamar last time, but then realized he might not have gotten to hear because he wasn't on the listener level. So. Oh, that's no good. Yeah, 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 totally. So Itamar, thanks very much. And then we got a couple of late-breaking patrons. Hedowin at the friend level. It's great to see you on Discord. And Wolfdog joining up as a supporter. Thanks, everybody. Hey, if you want to support the show besides being a patron, there are other things you can do besides joining up and giving us money. By the way, there are free Patreon memberships as well. Like, you can just sign up as a free member and... I don't even know what that does. But if you want to support language in other ways, here's how. You can tell friends about us or leave us a review in all the places where reviews can be left. You can follow us. We're Because Lang Pod in all the places. 
You can leave us a voice message on our website with SpeakPipe or just send us an email with your ideas or even your voice. That's hello at becauselanguage.com. Our theme music was written and performed by Drew Kaplyanov, who also performs with Ryan Bino in Didion's Bible. Thanks for listening. We'll catch you next time. Because language. Something that Hedvig and I have become fond of saying is that one of the most punk things you can be today is hopeful and like pro social. Yep. Um, third, third places are punk as fuck, right? Yep. Like they are like the way to be punk today is like get involved in your local community, go find if, if a third place doesn't exist, fucking make one. And yep. just just do a cool community garden or a wicked little lending library or whatever it happens to be and make that third place. That's how we're going to like anarchist our way to a better world. Our internet communities are awesome and we love them, but they need to be in meat space mm-hmm. so that you run sure. across people you don't run across.